If you have smudge marks on your windows, make yourself comfortable. This is the Make Dogs Your Life Podcast. Welcome, everyone, to episode two of the Make Dogs Your Life Podcast, the show for anyone who works with dogs or wants to know a little about a little bit more about dogs. This is for you, and I am super pumped today for two reasons. One, uh, this is just uh, an amazing, amazing journey already, and I've only uh, recorded one episode before today, and I've gotten such great feedback. So thank you, everyone, for your emails and uh, for any reviews you may have left. I really appreciate it. Um, I really have been uh, really overwhelmed with the with the support for this show. So I'm, I'm very excited to keep going and to make episode two and many, many more after that. I'm really pumped about today's episode because I have a great, great interview with a, an amazing author. And, you know, there's there's one book that I can look back on that I think is like a like an epic book about dogs. And one of like the, the most important books, in my opinion, uh, for any dog owner or lover that's been written in the last decade. And that is The Lost Dogs, written by Jim Grant. Uh, and this is a story all about the Michael Vick story um, about the pit bulls that were were used for fighting and their their comeback. Uh, really an amazing, amazing story. Uh, and one of my favorite dog books of all times. Uh, and, and more recently, uh, Jim has put out a book called Wallace, which is just a great story about a great dog. And it really shows, uh, I think anybody who's involved in animal rescue will really like this book because it really shows how if you don't give up on a dog, give the dog the things it needs, just what this dog can do. Um, and I think it shows the inner potential of all these dogs sitting in a shelter out there. So I know you're going to enjoy it. So I don't want to, I don't want to keep you too long from that. So without further ado, here is my interview with author Jim Grant. Okay, I'm uh, joined here with uh, author Jim Grant. Thank you so much, Jim, for taking the time to, to be with us. My pleasure. And we have, uh, if you're not familiar with Jim, he is the author of what I consider one of the most important books, uh, dog books of the decade, which is uh, The Lost Dogs, which is all about the Michael Vick dogs, which if you've been living under a rock for the last five, seven years, is the, the story about the football player, Michael Vick, who was uh, busted for illegal dog fighting. And then his more, uh, Jim's recent book is Wallace, which is a Frisbee dog champion, Wallace the Pitbull, which is just a, a really cool story. If you're involved in animal rescue in any way, uh, this book is really going to speak to you because it shows what uh, is possible for a dog if you just don't give up on him and, you, and he has the right, the right tools and, and people behind him. So Jim, uh, I got to start with saying, you know, your background, um, why don't you tell me, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit of, about your background and, you know, I, I know you, you know, your, your background is as a sports writer for Sports Illustrated, so just give me your background and, and let me know how you got involved in this, this crazy world of dog writing. Well, yeah, I sort of stumbled into it. You know, I, I, I've worked at Sports Illustrated for about the last 10 years, but I'm not really a sports writer. I've, I've worked at eight or nine magazines over the years, and I'm just generally a writer. I, I think of myself as a writer in general. Uh, I happen to work at a sports magazine right now, so that's sort of the focus. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm mostly an editor at Sports Illustrated. I work on other people's stuff, but sometimes when I get slow, I'll, I'll do a little writing on my own. And so it just came to a point in late 2008 where um, I, I knew I was going to have a little slow time coming up, and I thought I'd try and write something. And by far the most popular sport – uh, amongst our readers is the NFL. So I was just looking for an NFL story to write. And I was doing some various Google searches and I came across a small article that mentioned the Michael Vick dogs and that they were being rehabilitated and possibly put up for adoption. And, uh, you know, I, I just wondered what that meant. How do you rehabilitate a fighting pit bull? And, and what do they mean by adoption? Are they going to be in homes with their dogs, with children? And it just seemed really interesting to me. And of course, this was you know, the dogs were first confiscated in April of 2007. So this was almost a year and a half later. And I thought, well, where have these dogs been all this time? And it seemed like there were a lot of interesting questions to be answered there. And uh, So it just went from there. I pursued it, wrote a story for the magazine that ended up on the cover, and that turned into the book. So um, stumbled into it, and it's been fun and interesting and incredibly educational. 
And, you know, did you have any um, experience or impressions of pit bulls before you, you started researching this? Uh, I really knew nothing about them. I knew what you saw in the headlines, you know, which, you know, is all the bad stuff. And, and uh, I had no reason to doubt all those things. I never thought about it a whole lot. I, I just understood them to be, you know, these very aggressive dogs that were causing a lot of problems. And, and so, uh, you know, I really knew nothing. And, and that was one of the things when I started out that I think really made a difference was, you know, as I started to report and ask questions, I started to get a lot of feedback that countered that perception. And so part of what I was after when I first wrote that initial article for Sports Illustrated was, what is the truth here? What's really going on with these dogs? And, and I think that pursuit of really trying to find out you know, the, the true answers came across in that initial story. And the idea, the fact that I wasn't, um, you know, an advocate on one side or the other, and I, I didn't have an ax to grind that, that really came through. And I think in the end, it made that initial story more powerful and had more of an impact because, uh, it was clear that I was not trying to prove a point one way or the other. I was just trying to get to the bottom of it. And, and that helped. Ah, oh, very cool. Very cool. Um, probably one of my favorite aspects of the book is how you so accurately and might well what seems accurately you describe and you you kind of put us in the head in the mind in the body of the of these dogs that are imprisoned in the bad news kennels and it's it's such a vivid picture you paint and i think it's some of the it's just such great writing because i was so sucked in and i thought i was that little brown dog you know i i, I mean i i just felt it how did you how did you paint such a vivid picture? Well, uh, a couple of ways, you know, and it, it's funny because, um, shortly after I wrote the book, I was, you know, speaking somewhere with a group of people and somebody asked the question, like, you know, what made you decide to write from the point of view of the dogs? And I, and I sort of said, well, I didn't write from the point of view of the dogs. I just sort of tried to give you an idea of what was going on with the dogs from their, through their eyes. And I said, Oh, well, I guess that's the definition of point of view. So I, you know, I, I wasn't really conscious of doing that when I was doing it. It was, it was sort of a, a necessity because the first third of the book is really the behind the scenes of what was happening with the investigation. And, and that was really a sort of fascinating part of it. How I don't think a lot of people realize how close the whole thing came to falling apart on, on numerous occasions. So I was trying to document all that, but of course, that didn't really involve the dogs and the book was about the dogs. So I had to find a way to keep them involved in the early part of the story. So what I try to do is these periodic updates about where they were and what was happening with them. And, you know, the only way to do that was to sort of project a little bit on what was happening with them. And, and in order to try and do that effectively, I, you know, I visited all the locations where they stayed. You know, I talked to as many people I can that, that interacted with them. You know, the dogs had been, kept there was a gag order gag order a federal gag order so even this was two years after the fact a lot of these workers at the shelters and so forth you know couldn't talk about them and wouldn't talk about their experiences with the dogs but i was able to pick up some snippets that way i was able to visit the places where they were so i could see what they saw i could smell what they smelled and you know all that informed what i wrote and then you know i did a ton of research i read uh, a lot of books about animal behavior including you know academic studies of of you know dog behavior and so I used a lot of that sort of information to, you know, integrate with what I knew specifically with what I knew gen then generally about dogs and how they reacted and how they behaved in these sort of situations and, uh, you know, how some different sort of stimuli affected them. And, you know, I sort of combined all that to, you know, as, as best as I could, you know, put you in the place of where they were and what they were experiencing. Well, I mean, a really amazing job because I was just so emotionally in there and uh, I really felt connected with those with those poor dogs in that situation. And I just as I'm reading, I remember wondering, man, was Jim there? How, how does he, this is so is so vivid, really, really cool. Now, in uh, in my work as a dog trainer, I've had the pleasure of not really working with, but I've actually met a couple of these these prior Vic dogs. And I was wondering, um, I know you've met a couple too. What has been your impression of them now seeing them so much after their, their trauma there? Well, you know, a few things. I mean, you know, from the start, um, having never met a pit bull before doing this, uh, you know, there were a couple things that were always surprising to me. I was always surprised for the most part, how small they were. You know, I always, you always think of them as these big mean dogs and a lot of them, um, are smaller than you would imagine. There are some big ones, but you know, a lot of them were, were smaller than you thought. And the other, the other sort of striking thing about them was 
the biggest problem for most of them that they were dealing with was fear. You know, you thought there would be these hyper aggressive dogs, but for most of the dogs they took out of this property, you know, they were afraid of everything. They, you know, they, they had any interactions they had with people were negative for the most part. So they were afraid. And beyond that, they had been lived chained up in the woods. So they had no experience with the world. They didn't know what things were. I mean, it, these dogs literally had to be taught to walk upstairs. They had never seen stairs before. You know, you flushed the toilet and they freaked out. You dropped a pan in the kitchen and they freaked out. You know, they just, they weren't familiar and they, and they were sort of, sort of a little nervous about everything. So, you know, the, the initial thing about the dogs were just striking, you know, those two things. But then overall, you know, once you get to know them and they, they get a little more comfortable around you and you get a comfortable around them, you know, it strikes you that they're just dogs. They do the goofy things that dogs do. They do the stupid things that dogs do. They do the annoying things that dogs do, you know. Um, and then some, sometimes those are exaggerated to one extreme or the other, but, you know, they're basically just dogs. And, and the other part about it that comes through is that, you know, they're all different. You know, you'd think they'd be similar. They've all come from the same place. They've all been raised the same way. They would have these similarities. But, you know, at the end of the day, they're all different. They all have their own problems. They all have their own issues and they all have their own strengths. And, and so, you know, you come to realize that every dog is just a dog and, and you have to sort of approach them that way. Yeah, I think if I have my numbers correctly, of the there were there were fifty one dogs that were rescued there, and I think forty seven of them were were saved. I think I think one I think one or two died from health problems, and uh, but I think forty like I think if I remember my numbers, forty seven of them. That's right, forty seven. Yeah. Okay, now, I mean, I'm a I'm an animal rescue guy, uh, and I, I can I saw I saw in the book too that it seems like everyone was surprised by that. Even the experts, even the dog rehabilitators. Right. I mean, what, what happened was, and this was one of the really rare and groundbreaking things about the case, was, you know, they confiscated the dogs, and traditionally they would be held as evidence, and then once they weren't needed, they would be destroyed, assuming that, you know, they were sort of beyond help, and that, as we all know, there's thousands and thousands of good dogs out there in shelters, so why attempt to spend a lot of time and effort and money you know, rehabilitating this small group of dogs, you know, when there's already so many good dogs out there waiting for homes. Um, but there was such a huge public outcry. The, the federal prosecutor received so many letters and calls and emails um, that they decided to try and do something. And they partnered with the ASPCA and they put together this, you know, sort of committee of experts to go in there and evaluate these dogs individually and, and try and see if there were any of them that, that, you know, had the potential to be rehabilitated and be become, you know, citizens of a community and and going into it you know a number of these experts sort of felt like you know maybe 10 percent out of 47 so maybe four or five dogs maybe we get four or five good ones we could save and then when they went in there they, they came out with 47 you know and and that surprised everyone and it was uh it was really an eye-opening moment and experience and, and just to see you know where the dogs have gone since then and what they've been able to do and, and how successful that's been has, has changed a lot of things and a lot of practices um, you know, within the rescue community and within the shelter community and, and how these dogs are viewed and treated. And do you, do you have like a, a personal favorite success story of any of the Vic dogs? Oh gosh, that's, uh, that's tough. It's like asking you to pick your favorite child. <laughs> you know, one of the, one of the stars of the book and, and who's, who's, uh, hard not to love is Johnny Justice. He's, uh, you know, he's a little guy and he's sort of got this rough and tumble attitude, but also this really sort of make the best of everything kind of attitude. And he's silly and, you know, and he's just a great guy. It's hard, hard not to love Johnny Justice. And he's been one of the most, you know, inspiring success, su excuse me, success stories out of all of them. So um, for all those reasons, I, you know, maybe I would pick Johnny. Yeah, no, that's a tough question. Yeah, because I mean, I, I would love them all and everyone you know, that, I, that I've met, you know, uh, Cherry Garcia, Hector, they've all been just, just sweet. They're sweet. They're, they're pit bulls, you know, and they're just, you know, they're, they're just show like the resilience of the breed, you know, that they, they can bounce back. They, the good thing about dogs is they don't hold grudges. They will forgive and forget. And, uh, it's really just a, I'm, I'm just amazed every time I, I meet them. Um, was, what was the big public reaction to the book? I mean, I know it from the dog perspective. Every you know, we all love it. But I mean, were people who were like you know pro Michael Vick? Did they give you you know any attitude for this book or anything like that? Well, I think probably most of the people who were pro Michael Vick didn't read it. You know, certainly there was some you know I don't want to say negative reaction, but there were people who didn't didn't like it. But overwhelmingly, um, it was positive. The book did very well. It was a it was a New York Times bestseller. So. Hopefully, spread the word. If 
pretty far and wide. And, and, um, you know, I think it, it received a lot of, um, critical accolades and, and, um, got a lot of attention. So I, I think, you know, overwhelmingly positive, but like I said, I think the people who would be inclined to react to it negatively probably just didn't read it. So, um, it's a little bit of a skewed audience. Okay. But yeah, so you've got a, but like I said, I, I looked on, uh, an Amazon, uh, yesterday and it has 277 five-star reviews uh that's pretty impressive <laughs> yeah you know it, it, the amazon reviews have been very really good it was at one point amazon had a list of like you know their top 100 highest rated products across all product categories you know and that's so it's based on amazon ratings these are the 100 best rated products on Amazon and the Lost Dogs was on that list for a long time. I don't know if it still is. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. have been very, very favorable. Very, very cool. Very cool. Now I know cause I had spoken with you very briefly, um, after we had finished the Lost Dogs and, uh, you know, everyone of course wants to know what your next project is and everything. And I know you were, you were a little hesitant maybe to, to do another dog book. What attracted you to the story of Wallace and how did you hear about him? Um, well, you know, I'd heard a little bit about Wallace just in, in the process of doing the Lost Dogs research. Um, so I knew who Wallace was. And then Clara and Rue Yuri, the people who had adopted Wallace, um, had also adopted one of the big dogs, Hector. Um, so I got to know them pretty well. They, they were also at that time living pretty close to New York City. So when we were doing promotional events for the Lost Dogs, they would often attend. And, and so I got to know them pretty well. I met them numerous times and, um, spent some time with them. And, uh, actually Rue had the idea. He approached me and said, you know, I've always thought Wallace's story would make a pretty good book. Would you be interested in, in working on it with me? And, and, uh, so it went from there. And, you know, the appeal of Wallace, like you say, I, you know, I, I didn't know that I, that I really wanted to do another dog book right away. I just, uh, I thought I would definitely write another dog book, but I, I didn't know if I wanted to do two in a row, but, uh, it was just such a great story. Like you say, it's, um, you know, especially the Lost Dogs had been sort of a, um, a tough breed in the sense that it, it was really graphic and, um, you know, really showed the, the, the brutal side of dog fighting. And Wallace was such uh, the opposite of that. It was such a happy story and such a, you know, a story for everyone and a family story. And, um, you know, it, it really showed, like you say, it was, you know, the, the best of what can happen. And this is a, a, not only a shelter dog, but a dog that struggled in the shelter, was considered unadoptable you know, on the verge of being put down at the last minute, Clara and Ruth stepped in to, to save him. Um, and then in the process of trying to find something to do, he was just a smart, energetic dog. They stumbled into the world of competitive Frisbee. And, and this guy went from, you know, shunned rescue dog to world champion Frisbee dog. And, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a great story in that sense. And, and, you know, detailing uh, how that happens and what goes into it and the struggles and difficulties is, is um, you know, it was fun and interesting, I think, to get into it. And it was just a too good a story not to write. Awesome. And I think, um, you know, pit bulls, I think, in general are very, like I said, they're very resilient dogs. And uh, I, 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 stories like, I mean, Wallace is a special dog. But, you know, I think stories like this, um, you know, I think there's I think there's people all across the world that have similar stories with their dog. I know uh, another interview I'm going to be doing in the future is with Joe Dwyer, who um, has his rescue, uh, <laughs> pit bull Shelby, who was really abused and really shut down and now is a therapy dog doing amazing work, helping people, uh, who really need a boost. Um, and it's just amazing how, how I see these dogs, uh, just bounce back. You know, they're like the, the perfect underdog. Uh, they bounce back, they, they fight and they get to the, the top of whatever they're doing. Um, do you know, I mean, I know that uh, that Rue and Clara were working or volunteering in a, in a shelter. They probably worked with tons of dogs. What was it about Wallace that, that made them go out on a limb like that? Well, I think um, for them, they felt that it was for the wrong reasons. You know, they felt the, that, you know, there was, um, you know, there was some sort of momentum to put Wallace down because they felt he was unadoptable and, and difficult to handle and possibly dangerous and uh and they didn't agree with that they they thought you know that was it was more the fact that just nobody was willing to put in the time and effort that he required and they they could see that he was in fact a good dog or they felt that he was a good dog uh that he just had had more needs and needs that were you know difficult in a shelter you know he doesn't get along well with other dogs 
So you're locked up all day with, you know, 30 or 40 other dogs. You know, he got a lot of energy. You know, he gets out for an hour a day. He's got, you know, he's smart, but he gets very little stimulation. So, you know, they could see that, you know, in the right circumstance, he could really succeed, but he was in the wrong circumstance. And, you know, that was not a reason as far as they were concerned to, to put a dog down. And so uh, they had a problem with that approach. And, and that's what really, you know, inspired them at the, you know, at the last minute to step in and, and be the ones to take them on. And I think that's so important. You know, I, I do a lot of work with shelters and rescues and, you know, the, the shelter environment is just so detrimental to a dog's uh, mental state. And they, it, it's hard for you to even see what the real dog is like. So, I mean, fostering is just so important. So if you're out there and you foster, God bless you, because that is the way to, to really see these dogs, to help them and to get them adoptable. So fostering dogs is just so, so important. And I think Wallace is like one of the ultimate success stories of that. Now, a pit bull as a frisbee dog, I mean, that's pretty unique, isn't it? They usually I, don't see them there. There's been very few, if, if, if any, before Wallace. But yeah, there's generally these border collies and, and Australian cattle dogs and, you know, these small, agile, fast dogs. And, uh, you know, this Wallace in particular is a pretty big guy with, the old big cinder block kind of head. So um, he was, he was the odds were stacked against him from the start. And, and certainly he raised a lot of eyebrows and yeah, that was one of the great things about him. You know, he became sort of an icon and, and really one of the first, you know, pit bulls to go out there and start changing perceptions, which he did, you know, catch by catch, basically, you know, he would go show up at these events. And at the beginning it was like, Oh, isn't that cute? That's nice of you to try. And, you know, then he started winning and people, people started looking at all this and, it's like, wow, what, what's this dog doing here and how's he doing it? And, and uh, you know, if you had these these perceptions about a pit bull and then you watch them go out in the field, you immediately had to change your mind. You had to rethink what you thought you knew. And, you know, then after the competition, people would come over and say, oh, can I meet him and pet him? And they would. And, and he was great. And, you know, they had to rethink again what they thought they knew. And so, you know, every place he went, you know, he, he sort of changed opinions. He was out on a field. It's an open field where they play these things. There's dogs around there's people around there's you know there's sort of nothing to stop him from getting in trouble during one of these events if he wanted to but uh you know he proved again and again that he was above that and and uh you know he, he changed a lot of minds that way and, and just showed what was possible you know not only uh for a rescue dog but for his breed you know and that was um that was a big part became a really big part for rue of what they were doing and and uh you know drove him to to try harder and to press further with wallace and and uh, to spread that word and, and uh, you know, upend a lot of those misconceptions. And was there a lot of um, resistance or I should say uh, pe like negative um, talk or like just people saying, wait, you can't have a pit bull. I'm, you know, was there resistance about uh, the breed coming into these competitions? Uh, th there was a little bit here and there. I think, um, you know, more surprise and more concern. There were, there were, you know, especially in the beginning, there were people who were concerned about it. Like no one said flat out, you can't do that. But, um, you know, th there were definitely some people who were, who were nervous, uh, when Wallace showed up. Um, but, you know, again, once, once he sort of established himself, he, he became known within the circuit and everybody knew, Oh, that's Wallace. He's okay. You know, and, and, uh, that's, that's part of what was, you know, Wallace achieved was showing people that and, and teaching people that. And yeah, such a great champion for the breed, just changing minds uh, every day he goes out there. Um, he's, he really is a, a superhero for the breed and just to, just shows what what's capable um, of him uh, and, and the, the breed in particular. So, I mean, I love the story, just him changing, changing minds, you know, one at a time. And if you haven't seen Wallace in action, I'm going to, if you're on the, if you're listening to this on the Make Dogs Your Life website, I'm going to link to a couple of videos from YouTube to see him in action. It's really quite impressive. Um, and I'm also so impressed with, with Rue and the amount of effort and training. And he just so went so out of his way to help this dog. Um, I've never met, I've never heard about someone as dedicated as, as Rue and, and Clara were with, with Wallace. Um, now, I know Wallace has had some health problems recently. Can you just, I mean, do you know how he's doing? And for those who don't know, Wallace has, um, he's diagnosed with cancer. It was in September. That's right. Yep. yep um, sure. Have you been in yep. touch with Rue? How are they doing? Yeah, I've been in touch with them regularly. I think I might be heading out there in a few weeks, actually. Um, he's doing okay. You know, they, they opted not to go with uh, chemotherapy. I forget the name of the kind of cancer he has, but it's the one that attacks sort of the blood vessels. Um, 
over time. And uh, they opted to go with a sort of a experimental holistic treatment, some sort of mushroom extract, I think it is. And uh, so far, he's been doing great. I mean, originally they told him it could be anywhere from a few weeks to a few months, but now it's four months into it, and and so far so good. So um, he's been doing great. They they put together a little bucket list for Wallace, um, you know, of things that they want to do, and they've been spoiling him and and clicking down this list one item at a time. And they've made a lot of really cool videos about some of these adventures they've gone on with them. And uh, those are all posted on the Facebook page, or Wallace the Book Facebook page, or Wallace the Pitbull has his own Facebook page. You can go look at those there. They're they're a lot of fun. They've done a really great job with those. Um, so he's been he's been living large and and doing okay right now. Okay, yeah, and I'll link to all those things as well. And yeah, I have been following the bucket list uh, on Facebook, and it really is fun uh, to see him doing all these things. And uh, I know the next big goal is we want to get him on the Ellen Show. Yeah, we've got a petition going now for that. So one. yeah, that 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 would be awesome. And it looks like he's uh, he's definitely enjoying his time here. But hopefully, uh, he's around for for a long time to come. Um, last question for you, um, Jim. Since the release of the Lost Dogs, which was back in 2010, I believe. Do you feel the the public perception of pit bulls has changed at all? You know, I do, and, and I don't know if that's just because I've become more immersed in it. I, I I'm around people that are more open to that, you know, possibility. But certainly, it, it seems to be. I mean, I think. I mean, I see tons of them around, or at least mixes around. I think they're being adopted more frequently. They're being accepted, um, and and that's what I see from where I am. You know, I, I um, you know, I don't know if there's statistics or if there's any way to track if there if the adoptions are up in shelters. I know it is still the number one shelter dog, um, but I think there's definitely a sense that you know they've gotten a bit of a bad rap and and that they aren't or shouldn't just be dismissed. You know that they, there is a possibility for these dogs to be good family dogs and and you know there's. There's tons of them out there who are who are doing that. And it's the same thing, just like the way Wallace started. You know, every time one of these dogs shows up in a neighborhood and, you know, behaves himself appropriately the way people expect him to, it it changes minds. And it's sort of you got to go one house at a time, one block at a time, one neighborhood at a time, and and uh, you know, slowly, you know, you'll you'll change the perception on a, on a wide level. Well, I think I think in, in books like yours, really I think have made a like a really monumental difference in in changing that perception and making taking pit bulls to like the mainstream in a good way which is rare so uh you know on behalf of all pit bulls jim thank you very much for both these books and they're also just great reads um well, what are you up to next what's up what's next uh on your agenda uh, i don't know yet I, they, they keep me too busy at work i haven't i haven't started anything new but i've got some ideas i just can't get to them so Hopefully uh, something will happen soon. Awesome. Well, we look forward to uh, to your next book. And thank you so much for taking the time with us and uh, for doing uh, these, these great books about just a great breed. Thanks for having me. All right, Jim. Thank you so much. Well, there you have it. Wow, I told you that was a good interview. I tell you, I really enjoyed talking to Jim. Uh, he's a really good guy and a great writer. And... I think, you know, has, has been one of the good voices for pit bulls. You know, pit bulls need champions. Uh, they need heroes. They need people shouting from the rooftops how great they are and championing the breed to, to get rid of all this bad press they've gotten. And uh, I really, if you haven't checked out Jim's books, uh, they're a great read. He's a good writer. He weaves a really good story. Um, and they're just great books. So I really, um, I really encourage you to go check those out. Um, so thank you everybody for sticking with me here. And you know what, if you get a moment, you know, give me some iTunes love, go over to iTunes. I know sometimes it takes a couple minutes, five minutes out of your day, but it would really mean a lot to me. I would really appreciate it. And it would really go a long way in, in spreading the message and getting more people to find us here so that I can do my best to help more people and dogs, which is my ultimate goal. So if you get a moment, please do that. If you've done it or are about to do it, Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to do that. I'm having a lot of fun here in this podcast, and I want to keep it going. If you've got any feedback or suggestions or you know ideas for topics or people you want me to interview, you know, send me some. Leave me a comment either over on the blog or uh, send me an email. Just let me know. I want to make this as much as I can about you guys. So give me feedback as much as you can. I always love it. That's it. Episode two is in the bag, in the bank, it's down, 
Uh, I'm really having a lot of fun here. Um, have a great day in whatever you're doing, and I will see you real soon in episode three. Thanks for listening. If you're interested in turning your passion for dogs into a career as a dog trainer, head over to makedogsyourlife.com. See you next time.